Welcome to the milk bar. 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 Welcome along to episode 705 of the Milk Bar. Jason Forrest here with you as ever. And coming up on the show, and that bit between Christmas and the New Year, uh, we bring you uh, Matt Sheldon here. He is a writer-director who's got a very personal story to tell in his latest short film, which will be streaming in January. We will be hearing about Mamma Mia from one of the cast, one of the dynamos, uh, Nikki Swift joining us for a bit of a chat about that, because it's at the grand mid-January. Uh, we will be finding out about some of the music in the world of games from a gaming music composer. Uh, plus, uh, we'll be heading back uh, to, to an interview I did just before Christmas, uh, whereby we'll be getting some great ideas from SodaStream on what we want to enjoy when it comes to some drinks over the festive period. We've got the new year as yet, so that'll be a big time for drinks, I'm sure. We can go non-alcoholic or less alcoholic and get better value too. Simon River, TV chef, letting us know about that. And we'll also uh, be finding out uh, what's been going on on telly uh, in the shape of the Madame Blanc mysteries as well. Uh, there was a Christmas special, which is still plenty of time to enjoy on My Five. We'll be chatting to the star of the show, Sally Lindsay. That's all coming up on the show this week. <laughs> The Electricity in Me is one of the latest pieces of work from writer-director Matt Sheldon, who joins me now for a bit of a chat. Hello, sir. Nice to meet you. So, first of all, uh, tell us a little of the background of this work. This is a short film. Um, um, it's about my birth mother, Joan, um, who came to uh, London uh, pregnant by her university professor. She was 22. She was from Canada. And and she uh, she she decided that she couldn't keep her baby and um, she decided that she had to give uh, him up for adoption and she gave the baby up for adoption the baby was me um she started a new life in london she died when i was 17 but i didn't know her i didn't know that um and uh, but i'd always known that i was adopted and that was a key part of my identity but um as to how i felt about her i was much more um conflicted i couldn't quite understand um who she was and i didn't know very, i knew very little about her um, um i was showing a picture a photograph of her when she was when she was 14 and i um i couldn't look at that photo really i kind of i think i must have looked at it for three or four seconds and then i didn't say anything i think i ran away actually um i just sort of didn't want to look at it didn't want to talk about it and it wasn't until my mid to late twenties where, where I decided that I wanted I wanted Canadian citizenship. Um, where I started to research who she was, uh, I found a birth certificate which gave me citizenship. And, and um, a couple of years after that, I tracked down her partner who held her hand when she died in in hospital, and she gave me he gave me her diaries, and that really was the beginning of the story um and, and that was the basis for this film and a film which it's not an easy subject to approach for anybody to tell this story even more so when it is your own story but equally i suppose it isn't in some ways as well uh, yeah exactly right i mean what right do i have to to tell her story um and share who she who she was like you know she hasn't got an agent she's she, she's her, her she she was laid to rest in in Canada. Um, her sisters, who I I since found in Canada, um, gave me gave me their blessing. But I, um, yeah, in some ways you could say, well, she she couldn't give her permission. Why, how how dare you tell that story? Why would you? Why would she want you to share her secret? Um, 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 but but when but you she, are she, that secret as well, though. You have some ownership over that too. Yeah. In as much yep. as you know, you are you are exploring yep. your roots, but through yeah. her eyes, I suppose. Uh, exactly right. I mean, I I wanted to find a way of 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 exploring her resilience, really, and her quiet rage, and some of her toughness and love of life that was expressed in her diaries. I wanted to find a way to give her a voice to 
um, to, to 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 tell us how it felt to to have a baby taken away from her. Her sister said to me, her sister said to me that um, Ruth Ann is a sweet, sweet woman who has treated me like family ever since I met her. And I've met her, I've only met her physically twice. And we message and she follows me on Instagram and she's, they, I mean, they, they followed the making of this film and they, they're incredibly supportive. She said, you were, you were her very essence. She thought about you every day. And um, basically you, she was never the same because she didn't, because she didn't have you. And the, the, the removal of something so important in her life, which was absolutely not by choice. I mean, the, the, the Canadian post-war uh, reaction to pregnancy in the circumstances your mother found herself in was mirrored. I mean, pr- around the world, uh, we had cases like this in the UK, uh, but we don't tend to hear those stories, particularly not now. And in, in such a way as, you know, you've got uh, a huge piece of social history that you're exploring here, as well as it being something which is part of your life and how you came to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think she, she, I'd like to think she would have given me her blessing for this. Um, she was an artistic person. She wanted to be a poet. She was only, she, she, I say only, she, she, um, she was a secretary for the University of London, but she, she would have, I like, I believe that she would have, she would have understood my need to, um, or my want to tell her story. Um, I mean, she, she, she was a, she had strong opinions. Um, she would have probably told me off in a few different ways. So she, her diaries are full of um, lamenting mm-hmm. on the failings of the people she loved around her. She was tough on the people she loved, right? She was not. She was not. Um, she was a rebel. She wasn't. I don't think she was necessarily easy to be around. She didn't suffer falls badly, um, but she was kind of fun too, right? And um, and she had a, a, a seriously dark sense of humour as well. And how much have you discovered in you which was part of her? Because so you can you can project, and and that will happen. Yeah. But how much do you, yeah. as as somebody who analyzes these things for a living, yeah. when it comes down to short films, what do you think's there? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. It's the best question. The worst question. Um, I I'm pretty stubborn, pretty determined. Uh, Joan was Joan was extremely stubborn. Um, she wouldn't do what anyone would tell her um maybe, maybe there's something maybe there's something of, 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 of some of that is true you used to describe my birth father as um immovable maybe all three of us were sort of a tie together like that um make our minds up to do something even even when it may not be the most sensible course of action or the or the or even the right thing to do mm-hmm. um um she loved words. She loved poetry. Her diaries are beautifully written. Um, I, I don't think I, I, I couldn't say my writing can hold a match to what she used to write. She was a, she, she, she was a I believe um, a, a really talented poet. Um, I, I'm no I'm no expert on poetry, um, and I think there's something there in, in that. I, I believe there's something there in that 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 that, that brings us closer together. And you know what? She's she, she was my only flesh and blood, so there's something there too. Yeah, I mean, you've mentioned your birth father, and is that somewhere else yeah. you've explored, or is that something which is is an absolute no for you? No, no, I, um, it's a good, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's been something that I ignored for a very long time. I, I was, it's been a process. I, I've been happy to. I, at first, I was happy to be adopted, but I didn't want to talk anything. Don't talk to me about. My 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 parents, my mm-hmm. birth parents, my my bio, biological connection. Then I spent many years getting to know who Joan was through the diaries. Um, I, I only, in, but I didn't want to know anything about my birth father, Eric Salmon, who was um, who was a, a theatre academic and a, and a professor of theatre and, and 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 wrote books on theatre and and uh, on books on famous dramatists. You can still buy his books on Amazon. Um, he once wrote a book that was had a foreword written by Sir Peter Hall, Rebecca Hall's father, mm-hmm. and he. Um, I didn't want to know anything about him. I was kind of, you know, I. I'm convinced he abandoned her. Um, he was 50, and she was 22 when she when she when she fell pregnant. Um, but I think 
as I wouldn't say I've mellowed about it, but I but but wanting to know more about him um, became a lot easier when I knew his name. I had to go to the university he taught at, actually physically go to Canada to the university to find a theatre program which listed his bio. And you know what? I can't deny it. He he looks like me, or I look like him. Mm-hmm. And and once I knew that. Once I knew his name, it, it, it's been quite easy to track down his kind of... He basically taught across North America for many years. He was he, he, he made TV shows in New York. Um, there's a really curious um, AP Wire news photo in 1961. He was touring with a theatre troupe and he was photographed in a, in a... I think in a St. Louis or Detroit police station having bounced a cheque for $2,000 um he was quite a character um <laughs> I, 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 and i don't mean that i don't mean that warmly actually mm-hmm. it's it's difficult though to discover things that you know might might be troubling uh but still a part of that picture and even though his existence still the story, had, isn't it? Yeah, yeah but it had no impact on you whatsoever after that time when you know he you, you, so you feel he abandoned your your mom and not that I know of. No, but, yeah, but you know, it's it's it is unusual to to be able to to see that and to do the research and yet document it and be able to share it. And is sharing this something that's going to help? Do you think, or or have you felt it's been quite the reverse? I'm never. Uh, this sounds. I think I'm not sure everyone. Will, I'm not sure people always believe me, but I don't feel necessarily traumatized by exploring it because of I think I've been I was so lucky to be brought up in such a loving home by my ad- adoptive parents by my by, by Mike Mike and Jenny Sheldon who 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 created an environment that that was 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 full of acceptance and and life and you know they they always they always looked after us um, um, and and I you know I, I guess you just you just get used to the story and you just accept it and that's who you are i i mean i mean something that's been very interesting is that a number of women who worked on the film have pointed out to me that they believe that she was assaulted or she was raped mm-hmm. um that was something i had not considered um she, joan always called always called him my monster throughout the diaries and and i have three or four five six volumes he only ever refers to my birth that father as my monster. Um, that is real. That isn't that isn't fiction. Um, and um, I, I that was something I found not easy to process. Actually, I take it the strength that you've had through the Sheldons, your yeah. uh, your your parents that your parents they are actually your parents. They may not be your birth parents, but they yeah. they are your parents. Yeah, yeah. And they will have yeah. supported you through this process. I'm going to guess. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, Mum had a little wobble when I first told her about the story, and, I, and she watched it. And I said, "It's all right, Mum. You always, you'll always be my mum. Mm-hmm. You know that doesn't go that doesn't go away." Um, and that, you know, that's you know what you know what is family, and um, you know what is what is really family, and that's kind of an interesting uh, that's an interesting an interesting topic to me actually. Yeah. Well, obviously. I, I see it from just talking to you. It's quite clear who your true family are. Your mom, your mother, sorry, your mother probably would have, you know, given a, 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 anything to change the circumstances which led to the separation. And you've sure. probably seen some that's of true. that through through the diaries. And that's only a hint of, of, of what she was thinking most likely because it probably would have been too painful for her to put it all down on paper. But That's true. It, when it then came though to to finding someone to portray her as part of this experience, I mean, how were you able to do that? And you know, when you you've got to try and get the essence of somebody you sadly only ever met before you can remember. Um, it was one of those serendipitous things. Um, I'd been tracking the actor for a while. Um, um, actually. Who lived? Who lived in? Actually, she lived in. She lives in. I live in. I live in Bow in East London. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laura lives in East London also, um, and um, I'd been tracking her for a while. She was in a Sundance film called In the Earth. Um, 
uh, that she was Biffa nominated for. Um, but a, a mutual friend introduced her. So I introduced her on email. I got to meet her in a cafe. But I actually had nothing written. I hadn't even planned the project at that stage. Um, I mean, I'd always, I, I'd tried a few times to make something, but I'd never managed to find a way to tell the story. And in knowing that I was going to meet Alora, I wrote the dialogue in in an afternoon, took it to Alora with the diaries, who read it in front of me there and then on the spot, uh, which was terrifying, actually. You know, <laughs> um, it, it's one thing to have someone who you, who you admire read something on email and maybe they email you back and maybe they don't. Um, but she read it in front of me and I was thinking, oh my, I was sort of said to her, I kind of didn't think you were going to read it. And I wasn't complaining, but I was, I was, I was, I, I was, I was pretty scared actually. And literally it was 10 minutes while I watched her read it and I didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, yeah, I'll do it. And about 20 minutes later, she read the, she flicked through the diaries and said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and I thought, okay, that's wonderful. But, we, she said, "I need to check with my agent. I need to check with my dates, and then I'll, um, and then I'll, um, then I'll let you know." And uh, yeah, she stuck to her word. But I kind of just—it was just the way she absorbed it, the way she talked about it. I just, I just knew that she was going to do something special with it, which she but, did. But so much so, you've now got effectively three mother figures here in the shape of. Yeah, the mother in the documentary, your mom, and sure. your birth mother sure. as well. So the, again, this it sort of expands your universe in some ways sure. and, and helps yeah, everyone yeah. share it with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my own, it's my, it's my own, uh, it's my own MCU, isn't it? <laughs> so we've got the the documentary. It's 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 up for awards. The, the, there's how's the uh, the award season gone so far? Because this is again not the reason you've done it, but it's so honouring to to get recognition that you've got so far. We've had a good festival run. I mean, festivals, uh, and this will be a world that most people aren't aware of. For short films, for short films, it's it's ridiculously competitive. It's it's terrifying. Um, Sundance just announced its 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 um its list for 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 January. Fifteen thousand people apply submitted films. Um, so we were really happy to get into Leeds, into Holly Shorts. Um, we premiered in um in in Holly Shorts in in LA in the Chinese Theatre, which mm -hmm. is an iconic cinema for 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 for, for film nerds like me. <laughs> um, um, Laura won Best Actor at the Cornwall Film Festival. Um. And we are we're hopeful of maybe picking something up at the London Film Week. We'll know that shortly. Yeah. Um. So it's 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 been a it's been a great run. Look, the last screening is tonight. It's the seventeenth festival. Um. And we will we will um we will put it out there online in January twenty three. So this is one to watch out for. The Electricity in Me is a title. And just briefly, some of the other team who've worked with you. I mean, this this is huge as well, isn't it? So we certainly need to name check some of the gang. Uh, no, we've had incredible, incredible artists working on it. Um, David Fuchs is a, a four times Vimeo um, um, staff pick cinematographer. Um, the Adam uh, Adam O'Neill um, worked on Gladiator and uh, Sam Mendes's Empire, Empire of Light. And um, two of the alien films. In fact, he's working on another alien film. I mean, incredibly high-end talent. Um, costume designer Sarah Burns. She worked. She's worked with kind of the US fashion label. Um, you know, the, the, the list is endless. Uh, the sound department have uh, all worked on feature films. You know, I'm surrounded by uh, incredibly talented artists. And do you have offspring who you're going to share this with as well? Ah uh, yeah, my son. Uh, um, my, my son. My son was a camera assistant on the on, on the projects as well. So uh, uh, I think he got. I think he got a, a cheeky little um, promotion halfway through the morning to become. Instead of being runner, he becomes. He became second camera assistant halfway <laughs> through the morning. I think. But uh, again, an experience for everyone involved, because uh, you had a, a Canada team as well, having filmed in both London and uh, across the pond. Yeah, we had a team, a second unit team who. We kind of hired through just tracking down people who knew the terrain. Um, they, they, they. I mean, you know, they were filming in I think minus fifteen, minus twenty. Um, the the sound, the, the sound, uh, the sound lead. Um, uh, he he worked on Ghostbusters and and one and got me some 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 uh, authentic Canadian uh, soundscapes. So we had a 
yeah, we had an awesome team all, all across the board. Well, and the fruit of those labours are visible in the final piece, the electricity in me. As you say, it'll be streaming in January. Hopefully, there'll be more cinema screenings as that gets picked up as well across the UK next year. But for now, Matt Sheldon, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Come the midst of January, one thing we all need is a bit of Greek sunshine. Somebody who can help bring that to the stage of Wolverhampton's Grand Theatre is Nikki Swift, a.k.a. Rosie in Mamma Mia. How are you doing? Hello there, Jason. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, all good here. And you must be excited to be at the Grand from the 17th through to the 28th of January? Yeah, I'm super excited. I've actually, I've been to Wolverhampton quite a lot, but it's usually to visit friends who are doing shows there. Yeah. And my husband was in a show there a few years back, but I've actually, I've done most of the theatres in the UK, but I have not done Wolverhampton Grand, and I'm really excited about it. And Mamma Mia is going to be taking to the stage, and as one of the dynamos, you're going to be yeah, singing it, rocking it up, and having a great time. I hope so, yeah. I mean, it's an incredible show, and the you know our audiences are always so generous in their kind of feedback and at the end they're all up and dancing on their feet and and singing along so it's a really it's a really feel good musical and i think especially in kind of january time it's probably what everybody will be wanting you know pretending they're on a greek island in the sun that I works <laughs> it absolutely works and as long as the heating's turned up high enough everyone will be happy very true very yeah, true we find you in your dressing room at the moment don't we Yes, I am in my dressing room in the, at Oxford New Theatre, which is where we are at the moment. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just actually, I've just got ready for warm up. So in about five, ten minutes, I'll be going to that. And then we've got a show tonight. Then we've got two tomorrow, two Friday, one Saturday, Christmas Eve. So, yeah, it's a, a lot going on. <laughs> I mean, it, it is uh, a, a big show when it comes to it by cast members because it is very busy on that stage at times. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. We have a big ensemble. And then, of course, you know, that we've got the Dynamos and the Dads and Sophie and Sky, all of their friends. Um, but we also have a company of 57 people who travel with us. So it's, wow. it's a huge amount of people. And, and you know, to keep us all kind of on the road and, you know, booking into the various digs all around the country and around the world, which will be later on uh, in the year next year. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big company to keep happy. But fortunately, we all get on really well. So that's a good thing. That helps. But I mean, uh, <laughs> when it comes to the show itself, though, it, it is just like the West End production and brought to the stage yeah. a, a, a theatre as well. Absolutely. Having seen yeah. it in the West End and seen it in Wolverhampton, if anything, I think I enjoyed it much more in Wolverhampton last time I was in because the stage is that bit bigger and you get a bit more space yeah. than the, the, the West End home of the show. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, like you say, it is exactly the same show. The costumes, the set, everything is the same. Choreography, the direction, obviously the cast are different. Um, but you're right, it does. I think this show definitely lends itself to touring because you go to so many different theatres and some, yes, bigger than others. Sometimes, you know, that it's a bit of a squeeze to get into some UK theatres, but mm -hmm. um, I think we'll be fine in Wolverhampton Grand because it's pretty big there. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it is, it is a... Uh, it's an exciting show for that. And I think just in terms of kind of everybody kind of doing their thing. And sorry, this is my, the girl who plays Tanya has literally just walked in the room. We share a dressing room, so she's <laughs> here, here to get ready. Um, so yeah, so what, what the audience will get is exactly what they would get in the West End. But yeah, I, not that I'm biased, but I think it's it's better. bigger and better. Yeah, she says it's better. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an amazing show, uh, which means I've got to ask you, favourite songs, come on, it's an amazing piece of music. Uh, it's rather show, a bit, the, the hits of ABBA, what more could you ask for uh, as, as a great yeah. performance stage every night? But you've got to have one that's a favourite. Um, that, that's the rules. I, I do. I love Super Trooper. I love it because it's it, when you're on stage singing it, it's the the it's obviously Donna and the Dynamos who sing it and it's it's the one time that all the girls are on the stage together because it's the hen party and and it's such an amazing song and the harmonies are fantastic so for me like as, as a singer I love doing that song just because I think it sounds really good and we get these amazing white lycra sparkly outfits not that's not a spoiler you probably all know <laughs> that anyway um but yeah, so in terms of that, it's a really exciting song. So definitely Super Trooper is up there. And Chikatita as well. And I'll ask them. I mean, they're all good. But like, the thing is, it, it, even Donna and the Dynamos are of an age now where you weren't around to watch ABBA the first time round. You know, you, it, it's, yeah. it's, it, but this music has just really stood the test of time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 
you know, I was very lucky. My I in my house, I grew up in Liverpool, but we had a very eclectic taste of music in our house, and <laughs> and we listened to ABBA and obviously the Beatles and a whole plethora of songs. And my dad is a massive ABBA fan, huge, 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 huge. So a lot of the songs for me growing up were were ABBA songs. So I I've certainly grown up listening to them, and I went to see the original show in 1999 when it first opened in the West End. You know, way before the film because the, the musical came first, mm-hmm. and um. And yeah, and I remember going to see it and being like completely just in awe of all these people who were in feather boas and dressed up. And, <laughs> and I was just like, what is, what? I'd never seen anything like it because really it was the first kind of proper jukebox musical um, of this kind of modern time. We'd never mm-hmm. really had anything like that that had used band's music. And then of course we had We Will Rock You, Follow That and all the other ones that have come, Jersey Boys. So yeah, so I think for me going to see it, I was just like, you know, I was, I think, 18 or 19, and I just couldn't believe the reception that the show got. So it was always a show I wanted to be in, and then, you know, years later, I'm, I'm finally in it. So and they are. <laughs> right. And it's like, great yeah. to welcome you to Wolverhampton for the first time. It's going to be amazing to see the show once more at the Grand Theatre, 17th through to the 28th of January. 01902 429212 is the box office number, grandtheatre.co.uk to get your tickets. This is going to be an amazing thing to do, isn't it? Yes, absolutely do it. I promise you, you will have the time of your life. It's a brilliant show. It's fun. There's dancing, there's singing. And it's also, you know, and it's an emotion, emotional roller coaster. There's a, some really beautiful moments in it as well. So, yeah, do come along and see us. We'd love to see you there. Well, break a leg. Don't trip over anything too big on the Greek island <laughs> and have an amazing time as Rosie is one of the dyn- dynamos at uh, the Grand for Mamma Mia. Nikki Swift, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. When it comes to the computer games that we play, the music in them is an absolutely essential part of setting the atmosphere and making the gameplay work. Somebody who knows a thing or two about this is someone who's been uh, doing a great time at putting some fantastic music to some amazing moves on screen. It's Olivier Derivier. Good afternoon to you, sir. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, good to talk to you. And congratulations on your recent nomination at the Games Awards. Thank you. So tell us a, a bit about how you approach this, because I mean you're a BAFTA nominated composer, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> so how do Only you approach nominated. a game? <laughs> well, how do you approach a game? It's um, it's very uh, unique to me, right? Uh, it's not something that uh, you know. If you ask any composers, they will give you a different answer, right? So this is me and only me. The way I approach game is always by discussing with the creative director, the director of the game, let's say. And, uh, you know, they would tell me about the game, they would tell me about the gameplay, but basically the big difference, if you would ask with, between a movie and a game is like, I start discussing two to three years before the game is done. And I have this conversation through the, you know, couple of years, uh, even more for certain games and I'm doing music all the way, you know, so it's very different mm-hmm. as yeah, for movies. Because with the movie, it's a linear stream where with a game, you can be going backwards and forwards, and whereas you might have a particular hook that ties in with a certain character that you see, or a certain type of scenario that uh, you get on screen, it, it it has to fit together and turn into a, a piece of music that is that is listenable without glitches and jumps. Definitely, that's the the biggest let's say challenge that we have in games, but also this is the biggest um, motivation for me because it means that we need to approach music completely differently from the movies and we need to find a way that emancipate from that and it's for me you know as a creative person this is what is um, the most engaging part of the process. But there, are you a game player? Is this something that you enjoy and therefore know well? I've been a gamer since my very young age. Actually I, I wanted to make games and the only way to make games was to make music for games so I'm very happy now. And when it comes to the, the way in which, uh, you know, you get something from the game, once it does come out, are you then addicted to playing? I mean, are you now a regular at uh, the Plague Tale Requiem and maybe Dying Light 2? Are those two big ones for you to enjoy? Yeah, well, uh, the thing is, uh, working on the game, as I said, takes about two to three years for me. Mm-hmm. So when the game is released, I'm just done with it. I, I, I don't want to play, you know, the game <laughs> anymore. But what I have very much fun is uh, when I'm looking at, you know, YouTube or Twitch videos of gamers playing the game. And this is amazing. Like the reward is like beyond any award. But... <laughs> yeah, so it is down to you seeing somebody else experience what you've created rather than you, know, you playing the game. Because I, I suppose yes. as well, for you, you've, you've seen the walkthroughs, you know what can happen because you've composed for it. So it would spoil the game for you. 
Number one, yes, but uh, also the thing is like the camera now is turned because when they share the experience, they have the camera on themselves. So you see mm -hmm. their reactions. And so it's so, uh, I don't know how to say this. It's, it's very uh, unique because you can see the intimacy of the players because it's just one on the video and you see how they're affected, how they're getting fun or, you know, are sad because of the story whatsoever. It's, it's a very good feeling to me. Mm -hmm. and, and when you've got this you know, in post-production and everybody's out there playing it, is this when the composer walkthroughs come in? Oh, the walk the walkthrough composer, sorry. Um, well, this video series that I did, like to go through the game myself and showing how the music was, uh, let's say, thought, mm -hmm. uh, was something that I wanted to do uh, in contrast with the other videos that I did about Dying Light 2 that was more about the technicality of it. Mm -hmm. And the thing was like, going through the whole game myself and telling the people why we made the choices for the music was a way for me to communicate with the players or anybody else, you know, how the music can affect, you know, and how it was thought. It's not just like, oh, we need music as a background. No, it's rather every bit of music has a substantial reason to be there. And it's very important for me. And then sometimes there can be clues in the game on, on what you should do next based on the sounds that you hear. Yes, totally. That's where music for games is much more than just an illustration. It can really reward players, but also inform them. It can engage them more. It can make them focus on something else than just the sword that is in front of them. You know, it's a lot of power is given to the music and I'm using it extensively. <laughs> and uh, obviously the, the the awards are on their way. Uh, it's it, it's going to be interesting that January is award season for film, TV and games, isn't it? So uh, it'll be interesting to see how you get on there. And uh, uh, you know, any other big projects on the way at the moment? Well, game is, uh, you know, the game industry is very secretive and I have tons of things I would like to share with you today, but I just can't or else I'll be fired. So, But the, the, <laughs> suffice to say, there's some massive stuff on the way. Yes. <laughs> That will do the job. But I say, I, I, I assume that many people's Christmas gifts will have included uh, uh, yeah, the, the, some of your work, which is, again, another a great way of, uh, of sharing these things. And uh, where can we go for more information on all of your, uh, your walkthroughs from, from the composer's point of view? Well, you can go on uh, my website, olivierderivier.com, and you'll see everything that I did. So check that out, O-L-I-V-I-E-R-D-E-R-I-V-I-E-R-E, -E -E -E, for those who uh, aren't quite so good at spotting the uh, the spelling on that, such a, a wonderfully European-sounding name. Olivia, thank you for joining us. Have a great time over Christmas, and we look forward to more of your work as we continue to play some amazing games over the coming weeks, months, and years. Thank you, Jason. Have a great holidays. <laughs> This Christmas, many of us are looking for something a little bit different, but less expensive and maybe a bit healthier when it comes to enjoying a drink. We can go low or non-alcoholic. Somebody who knows how to make things just as good, even if it is a little less likely to make you tipsy, is TV chef Simon River. Good afternoon, sir. How are you doing, Jason? All right? I'm good. I hope we find you well yeah. and, and looking forward to Christmas with a glass in hand. Yeah, I am. It's funny, though, you know... I think lockdown made us all look at the way in which we kind of look after ourselves, really. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that first lockdown, we all did that same thing. 11 o'clock in the morning, oh, it's probably time to open a beer, open a bottle of Prosecco, <laughs> open a bottle of wine. And then by the second lockdown, we're going, oh, maybe we, we shouldn't do this. I think there's been a there's been a little bit of a change from that. But I think also the, there is a move in the industry. You know, in my real job as being a restaurant and bar owner, mm -hmm. then we notice more and more that people are sort of saying, okay, listen, I, I, I'd still like to go out for a drink, but I don't really want everything to be so packed full of booze all the time. You know, what kind of things can we do to maybe drop the ABV that we're doing? Mm -hmm. So I've been working on a bit of a cocktail project with, with SodaStream, and we've been working on the basis that you can actually still have a nice bit of booze in your drink, but putting some sparkling water as substitute for part of the booze. You can drop the ABV, but also you can also lose some of the sugar content from it, which again is another thing that you forget how much sugar there is in, in kind of in big boozy cocktails. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you, I'll give you a starting point. So okay. Aperol spritz, one of my faves, right? Yep. So an Aperol spritz, you basically have 50 mils of Aperol. You then top it up with Prosecco. So you're looking at 250 mils of Prosecco probably going into there. If you drop that Prosecco by 50%, and change it for sparkling water. So you know, whether you're using a soda stream or whether you just sparkling water out, out of a bottle. And what happens is you don't lose any of the flavor. It's just as refreshing. You're dropping the amount of booze that's in there. So you're lowering the ABV and you then just have, it, I, I'm, the word healthy is the wrong word to use, but <laughs> it's, it's, you know what I mean? You're kind of losing a little bit of that excessive booze in there. It's two for the price of one, basically, isn't it? 
Yeah, and it's well, and I think that's the other thing. I think you know we're in a cost of living crisis, and sparkling water is far more cost effective than the cost of booze. So again, you're making your booze go further, you're making your pennies go further, and it's so so important. And I'm not, I don't want to be a killjoy and say, oh, we should always drink this way. I think it's just saying, right, what can we do? If you decide that you do want to look at the odd night when you're out, or maybe when you go into January, you say, right, okay, I'm going to cut down on on, on what I drink. This is a really nice way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, Christmas doesn't have to be flat. Soda Stream, our kings and queens are zuzzing up water to the point at which it's even more palatable than when it comes out the tap. <laughs> yes, ex- exactly that. And, and, and there's loads of it. Another, another of my faves that we've developed is a, is a whiskey and ginger cocktail. Mm-hmm. So normally, you have whiskey and ginger, it would be a shot of ginger, then you'd open like, you know, a bottle of ginger ale, ginger beer, whatever, pour it in, loads of sugar in it. So what we're going to do, we get our whiskey, put it into the glass, cube of ice, piece of fresh ginger, peel yeah. it, Put that into inside a J cloth and squeeze to your heart's content, and you get beautiful fresh ginger juice goes into your whiskey. Then we're topping that up with sparkling water. So again, we're dropping down the calories, we're dropping down the sugar, we're dropping down a little bit of the uh, the alcohol content, and what you're getting is a long, lovely, refreshing drink. And the fresh ginger in it is absolutely delicious. Yeah, and completely warming. And as you may not have the heating on as high this year, but that's certainly going to reach your toes. Yeah, exactly. That lovely. I mean, there's nothing nicer. I love that feeling. I, I am a whiskey drinker, mm-hmm. and I love that warm feeling as it kind of, as it goes down. You feel like ah, you feel all of your stresses and strains disappear. <laughs> but when it comes to sangria at Christmas, you can uh, come to a, a slightly different we- recipe for that too. Yeah, well, you see, again, that starts off with cutting down that booze. So rather than having a whole bottle of booze, do half a bottle of wine and, and half of that content, 375 mils of sparkling water. Then treat it a little bit as if you were doing a chilled mulled wine. So mm-hmm. we have loads of slices of orange, clementine, whatever kind of orange fruit you've got around, a little bit of lime in there. I'm going to have more fresh ginger, but this time I'm just going to slice it and I'm going to leave the skin on so that can infuse into the wine. Then add a cinnamon stick, add some star anise, add some cloves, so all of those sort mulled wine flavors and that when you let it sit there is absolutely beautiful maybe a little bit of the citrus peel going in there as well really heavenly really really easy and it just looks beautiful and one of the things about that you can make massive batches of it so if you've got a load of people coming around you can make that the day before let it infuse it's going to be even better as next day yeah, and they say the point at which you add the sparkling water can be a little, a little bit later on as well, can't it? Exactly that. Yeah, so get let it all infuse, and then add the sparkling water to kind of like to to stretch it out, and also as I say, drop the booze content. Mm-hmm. And and the good bit about the soda stream, of course, is your water is sparkling as you want it to be too, rather than having the bottle sitting there going flat. It's exactly. it's sparkling as soon as you, and you you make it yourself. It's, it's exactly. like cooking, also- isn't it? Yeah, it is. And also there's there's a double setting on it. So there's like there's the normal setting where you do three little pulses of your mm-hmm. of your machine and that makes it for a lovely kind of like delicate sparkle. But if you pop five of it in, it's a really effervescent, it's it's a really kind of beautiful thing. And in something like the sangria, that's a really nice thing to do because obviously you're adding that to a sort of to a heavy content in terms of fruit and wine. And that's really lovely because it makes it, it there's something nice when you take to the table, it's properly bubbling. It's lovely. And, and carbonating things, I mean, I don't know who discovered that or how on earth they worked it out, but it doesn't half bring flavours to life. It's like air on your tongue. It really it makes those flavours really hit you in the face. Yeah, it does. It, it, it really, really does. It, it's it's that thing. If you you have anything that's flat as opposed to kind of sparkling, the difference that it makes is great. You're right. It, it's, it is. It's like it's dancing on your tongue. It is. Disco in your mouth for Christmas and a less, little less alcohol in the bloodstream as well. Can't be a bad thing, can it? Exactly, exactly that. Where can we go for more information, including some fantastic recipes from yourself? Okay, so there's there's loads more cocktails on sodastream.co.uk, and not all of them are alcohol. Uh, Loads of them are kind of like uh, kid-friendly as well. There's loads, loads of good information on there, Uh, and it's just a good thing to play around with. The machine itself is a good, fun thing. You know, when when we were growing up in the 70s, they were always a bit naff, but it's a pretty good piece of kit. I've, I've, I've been playing with mine for the last couple of weeks, and I must admit I've really, really enjoyed it, to the point of boredom for my friends and family, I'll be honest. If you, you've been making fizzy tea and coffee, haven't you? No, you can't do that. You can't do that. Can Anything. You? Uh, uh, <laughs> you can do a, a cold brew fizzy coffee would be beautiful. That does sound like an interesting that this afternoon. Yeah. Jay, I'm, I'm writing that down. That's a that's a great idea. I'm having that. Give it a go. <laughs> Simon Rimmer, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Have a brilliant Christmas. Good to see you. Thanks, mate. Take it easy.
with a festive special on the way and a brand new season two. We've got an amazing time ahead of us as we explore the Madame Blanc mysteries. Gene White back in action. The person behind the uh, the, the full on antiques dealer experience is Sally Lindsay, who joins me now. Good afternoon. Hi, how are you? I'm good, and I hope you're ready for Christmas. And having a Christmas special helps you be ready for Christmas, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I'm probably more the, the Christmas special is more ready than me actually. <laughs> to be fair, that's ready to go. <laughs> I've still got like a gargantuan amount of wrapping to do, but everything is sort of done. Sort but, of done. I, but I know you expected to buy antiques for people for Christmas. Is that how it works now? No, I, I'm rubbish at buying antiques. I mean, <laughs> Jean is a, in a is a fantasy created by. Uh, me and Sue Vincent, who's my writing partner, and we, um, we we'd love to be her because it takes hours and hours of research for every single object that we talk about. So it's uh, <laughs> it, we'd love to have that instant um, knowledge in our heads, but we don't, unfortunately. It's a big, big, it's a big uh, fib, and it's uh, Jean's a fantastic character because of that. Yeah, and it's not all plain sailing in San Victoire at the moment, though, is it? No. No, it's not. So the Christmas special, we start with Jean and she's been there eight months now. So it's eight months on from the last episode uh, from the, uh, of the last series. And she's really happy there. She's settled there. Uh, she doesn't quite know what to do with herself yet, but she's she's OK. Mm. And she um, it's Christmas time, so she's really looking forward to that. And then she finds out that, um, unfortunately, she gets a call from um, the police station saying that Caron has been arrested because his wife has been murdered and he was the one who found her so unfortunately she gets thrown into this this murder mystery straight away uh, this christmas murder mystery straight away and uh, so caron relies on her to to help him out so that's the one big major storyline and then there's another storyline where dom um has um his uncle come to stay and his uncle is the played by the amazing tony robinson and he's uh, so he comes to stay and he's got a bit of a dark past as well. But in all that, it's very Christmassy. There's trees, there's presents, there's Robin Asquith dressed as, a, as Father Christmas, uh, Sue Holden is dressed as an elf. You know, you can't really go but go it, wrong, to be honest. It sounds amazing. And it also explains what Tony Robinson was on about when he told me he was in a Christmas special he couldn't tell me about until now. So, uh, Oh, did he? Have you, yeah. have you spoke to him? He was at a natter the other week and he was saying that, yeah, he was oh, in a no, Christmas special. Oh, no, what a shame! And he was really excited about it as well. It, I oh, mean, he's well, brilliant in it. He's absolutely, I mean, honestly, he's, I mean, what an actor anyway, but he, he brings something out. When you, when you write something and... And, and you love it anyway, and then you get an actor of that calibre and they just bring it off the page. It's just the most magical thing. It's just been... He's just a great, great person as well, though. He's a massive laugh as well, which is always dead easy to work with. Yeah, but, but, but this, I mean, this must be really good fun for you, as you say, part of the writing team behind it as well, and your chance to explore a character and see where you go next and have that bit of control, yet still be sometimes surprised, I'm going to guess, as to what happens. Yeah, we we've created all sorts of you know. Usually we start with we start with the with the, with the objects mm -hmm. and the stories from 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 history, and then we build on that, and then we we put our brilliant characters around that. So our lovely regular characters are really strong in it, and we created them. They're just as important as the antiques, really, because we wanted people to go back every week and see what's happening to them as well. So it's um yeah, it's a really uh, it's it's two things. It's sort of character led, but it's also you know, antiques led and, and murder mystery. So it's, it sort of it intertwines those two things. And uh, season one out there on box set for those who haven't already yes, caught up? I think so on my five. Yeah. And also it's available on Acorn TV as well globally. So um, it's on two, two platforms at the moment. So, so that's that's great in, in our modern world. Absolutely. Have a bit of a catch up and then enjoy the new series. It all starts at nine o'clock on Thursday, the 22nd. It does. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we, we, we're very proud of it. So I hope you like it. Well, I say it, it gets going Christmas. And, and I think this, that's the way to start a series, isn't it? With uh, with a Christmas special. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's quite unusual to start when you usually end one. But we <laughs> we because of timings, we had to start with it. So and it's worked really well, actually. It's, we, we we're really pleased how it's come out. And uh, what can we expect in the future? Is season three on the cards? Uh, well, season two starts on, I think it's January the 5th. Uh, so it's every Thursday after that. Uh, so we, 
so it was another six episodes after mm -hmm. that and then hopefully i mean if people love it we, we we'll just keep making it if people love it we absolutely adore making it well people we do love, love it other. it's great so, yeah, well, and we have to make sure everybody is there to watch it as well so get it on my five if you haven't watched it elsewhere it's like acorn thank tv you. as well and uh, it is going to be uh, great fun having the, the the festivities and is it is it a, a sort of festive antique as well for us to explore this time uh, or can't you give too much away yes there is <laughs> <laughs> and that's the major storyline. Um, that's the. Well, it's not so much an antique. It's a very special Christmas decoration. So that's the sort of the, the heart of the Tony Robinson storyline. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, uh, but it's not so much an antique. It's a very very precious thing that's that um, that is, is is around and has been made for someone. So I don't want to give too much away. But yeah, there's all loads of lovely antiques in it. Oh, there's loads of art and antiques. Of course there is. It's going to Why be good. wouldn't there be? Absolutely. We do expect nothing less. Nine o'clock, <laughs> Channel 5, Thursday the 22nd. Also on My 5, catch up Acorn TV too if you want to get season one. Sit back, enjoy, and be part of the wonderful world of Jean White as you are Sally, Sally Lindsay, star of the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. That's lovely. Thank you. Well, that's a lot for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Next episode will be our end of year quiz. I hope to have you along for that one, which will be released in the run-up to New Year's Eve itself. That's all on the way. See you soon. Throw for now. Goodbye from the mill bar. 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 Yeah. Goodbye from the mill bar. Yeah.